welcome. Uh, this is a, a special uh, pre-reunion event and uh, Barry McCaffrey has very kindly volunteered to participate and uh, share his knowledge and wisdom about not only his days at Andover, which we're eager to hear, but also about the state of national security and foreign policy challenges. So uh, welcome and a preliminary appeal from, um, from the reunion committee. Um, may, I, may I make a brief, brief plug for an effort that we're undertaking for our June uh, 11th and 12th reunion. And that is to compile uh, a book of reminiscences by classmates of somebody or some people whom you knew at Andover and whom you remember fondly. And would you please write us uh, a, a reminiscence of that person? It can be short. Uh, there's no word limit. I abhor word limits, as you may know. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and we already have about 15, which are good, um, but we'd like to have more. So if you would send them to me um, at, uh, at my, my email address, M, it's M, uh, yeah, well, you can send it to Andover and, and get, get forwarded to me. Um, but uh, we'd really appreciate more reminiscences for our reunion book. So anyhow, without further ado, um, I would like to, to introduce uh, Barry. Now, uh, he says that he would like a long laudatory introduction, but I said, I can't do that. Um, and, and so he said, okay, just, just tell people that uh, they've probably seen me on NBC um, and, and uh, that I was a four-star general. Um, so uh, he's, he's a, a becomingly modest fellow. Uh, and uh, since he was only at Andover for one year, uh, he didn't really get to know many of you um, personally at, at, uh, at that time. And so I thought we would start today, uh, at least a little bit at the beginning, uh, with Barry uh, telling us about his uh, experience at Andover, how he happened to go there, uh, what teachers were particularly uh, effective and memorable, and uh, any friendships that he made that he particularly cherishes and the like. So uh, without further ado, Barry, please tell us a little bit about your Andover experience. Yeah, well, Michael, thanks for the shorter, shorter introduction I might have wanted. And by the way, before we get going, notice over my left shoulder, the product placement. I hope it still shows <laughs> up. Uh, the two volumes of the uh, Lincoln of Life that I intend to finish, look forward to finishing this uh, this summer. And Michael, it's such a distinguished uh, lifetime as a historian and such a gift to understanding our own uh, democracy. So I'm, I was very happy and excited to be able to talk to you today. Well, look, sort of by background, you know, I, I was an army brat uh, living in Paris. Um, at the end of my junior year, I was accepted to Johns Hopkins to go study medicine. Uh, my dad looked at, looked at me one day and said, you look, you look like you're 12 and you act like you're 10. You're not going to uh, college. Uh, I'm going to get you in a prep school. And we applied to Andover, I think Andover only. And I was accepted as a scholarship boy. Uh, my dad then got reassigned to Charleston, South Carolina. And I headed off to Andover in August or September of that year. And as the train pulled out, my parents and my sister were on the, uh, the loading dock. And I was looking at them in a window. And I used to tell people as the train slowly pulled out, it was hard to tell who was happier to see me going, me or my family. <laughs> Uh, I definitely was ready to leave home. So I, one of the, getting to Andover, I had family, Boston Irish family, Dorchester, Taunton, that sort of thing. They moved me in and uh, I had, you know, I had had a pretty strong record as three years in high school, class president and letterman and straight A student and, so, and actually pretty good faculty. And a lot of expats that had seen France and during World War II and stayed on teaching at this Department of Defense School. Uh, but I went from being the smartest boy in the world to <laughs> realizing I was sunk. Um, I didn't understand one thing that was going on in mathematics. Um, uh, it was just astonishing. So Andover with its resources stepped in and I got put in a math class of one person me uh, with some math P whose name I can't remember, lovely man. I'd actually go over to his house 
and spent a couple of hours a night at his house while he tutored me in math. Uh, the, uh, the academics, I thought, were just overwhelmingly fascinating. Uh, the, uh, I can never remember the name of my English professor. He was also a football coach. He was a, a World War II veteran of the uh, Rainbow Division. Uh, he had us memorizing pages of the Iliad and the Odyssey and Shakespeare. And uh, I, I just so admired and benefited from him. I got put in a Spanish class and I, I spoke French pretty well. And, and so I sort of rocketed on through. So Andover took me from 15 kids in a Spanish class to me in a Spanish class. <laughs> it was a astonishing <laughs> place. So I didn't, uh, you know, I tell people I didn't make much of a mark on Andover, but Andover made a huge mark on me. And, uh, you know, then when I, I went on to West Point, I was going to go into medicine, the tug of uh, the army and the army life. And so I went off to West Point and that was the days when in four years of engineering, science, and math, we had three electives. And uh, so the first year or two, to be honest, I was just plowing ground uh, that I'd gotten at Andover. The physics at Andover was phenomenal. Um, so the academic preparation was, I thought was just unbelievable. And I also like being away from home. I couldn't believe people were calling me Mr. <laughs> you know, a pseudo adult as we may have been as teenage boys. Uh, it was a great experience. The rest of my life, wherever I went, uh, the Andover boys, boys and girls, uh, the Exeter kids would always step forward and identify themselves, including that wonderful George H.W. Bush, who I just, uh, really admired and who I got to work with. I was his traveling military assistant for a couple of big arms control meetings and the Andover connection along with his military background was a huge source of strain. So anyway, bottom line is I, um, I have nothing but good memories out of Andover. Uh, Tanker McChristian, there were a couple, uh, Dan Lincoln, uh, who had been a lifelong friend. There were two or three army brats that I hung around with. Hanley Stevens, my roommate, the two of us are sort of odd ducks. We loved Andover. We admired each other. We've been in contact over the years. Brilliant, quiet, uh, mature uh, kid as a high school student, uh, which I wasn't. Uh, so great memories, unbelievable school. Been, I'm very proud I've been brought back into the school uh, sort of an aftermath of the Vietnam War tragedy division in society. But now I've, I've been back several times uh, as a speaker or supporting the Andover, Andover effort. So that's my background. Well, and if I could ask Barry, if you were to write a uh, reminiscence for our, for our book of reminiscences of PA, uh, what person or persons would you be most likely to write about? Well, you know, teacher, dorm master. I, I, you know, I think probably the strongest was that English professor. <laughs> the English, <laughs> math, and Spanish professors were just terrific, caring. The faculty at West Point, the faculty at Harvard. I did a couple of, you know, adult um, advanced education. And every time this happens, I don't know how to turn it off. Uh, yeah, I think the faculty were the ones that I would most want to remember. Uh huh. Okay, well, let's shift gears now. If I get you back on camera. There we are. Okay. Okay, well, thank you for uh, sharing your reminiscences of the school. Um, now, let's shift gears. Uh, in the coming 10 years, um, what do you suppose will be the most challenging? Uh, national security and foreign policy uh, problems that the country will face? And how do you think we should go about dealing with them? Well, uh, one sort of surprising comment, there, there's always a good argument to be made that in the last several years and several years to come, uh, America has uh, rarely been more secure in our national history. Uh, I mean, I can tell you the problems of national security and our vulnerabilities and our 
failures of leadership and technology for uh, two weeks if you uh, had the time. But as a general statement, uh, currently there are no peer group competitors uh, to the US Armed Forces, period. Uh, we're still, notwithstanding the economic data, people fool around with it, we're still the most powerful economy on the face of the earth. Uh, agriculture, aviation, pharmaceuticals, information technology, you know, I'll hear people argue that India dominates uh, us and I think that's nonsense. Uh, our freedoms, our creativity. Uh, so the bottom line is, you know, although we can enumerate and should the, the threats and how we might deal with them, uh, as a general statement, uh, we shouldn't expect uh, to return anytime soon to the kind of vulnerabilities that existed in the days of madness of confrontation with the Warsaw Pact and potential nuclear conflict and uh, that sort of thing. So we're actually doing pretty well. Now there are significant things to worry about. The number one concern I have, and I stay engaged in this, is the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction. It used to be nuclear, chemical, biological. Now I add cyber warfare. So in these four areas, uh, we need a global recommitment, which we had sort of achieved during the uh, days of Soviet Warsaw Pact NATO confrontation. We need to achieve some way of limiting, constraining under diplomatic and legal controls and through self-interest and through uh, transparent inspections, we need to be able to control these weapons better than they now are. And I've been involved in some groups, for example, I've changed my thinking. I think we need to constrain the ability of the President of the United States to unilaterally employ nuclear weapons. Th this is for our security. Uh, and, you know, we ought to put two other people in the loop. And you figure it out, you know, the Vice President, the Secretary of Dance, Defense, whatever. Uh, we need to pledge no first use of nuclear weapons. If you, and, and I just, sorry, I apologize. Every time a potential spam comes in, it knocks me, knocks me off air. Uh, so the WMD is a huge problem. And, you know, in some ways we're, uh, the biological weapons and, uh, and chemical weapons have a very low technology threshold to get in the field. I mean, anybody can make beer, can make unstable nerve agent. And, uh, but the, the one that really concerns me is cyber warfare. Uh, if you're a 17 year old pimply kid in Latvia, uh, you can and might already have broken into a US bank. Uh, so when I look at this field and I stay in contact with NSA and, and try and uh, stay basically conversant with the challenges. Uh, the armed forces has done pretty well in trying to harden our systems or to have so many alternatives to communication and command control that I think uh, we're not a very good target. They, they attack us hundreds of thousands of times a day to get into our systems. Uh, but the rest of the country, not so much, whether it's floodgates on dams or banking industry or you name it. So cyber warfare is another one. And then the nukes, uh, there's probably 35 nations that can develop a nuclear weapon within one to five years. Um, the Japanese could do it in a year. They could have 500 nuclear devices that would work within a year or so. And, but it's to our advantage as uh, as a global civilization to not continue to proliferate these weapons. And they're, you know, the more you get them out there, the more likely they are to be used. Pakistan and India are a great uh, case in point. Uh, if there's a conventional all out war between Pakistan and India, the PACs will start going under in 90 days and they'll go nuclear with catastrophic results. That's the reason we don't want Iran to have nuclear weapons a threat to Israel, who will respond if they think you're about to get a first strike. So we got some challenges. And one other topic, you know, who's our main threat? What should we be thinking about? Well, it's not Afghanistan. It's, it's actually not Iraq. Uh, it's not terrorism. It seems to me in the longer run, it's dealing with the People's Republic of China. 
and they are a giant economy. They're a successful society. Uh, fortunately, we have enormous integration of China's po political, cultural, and, and economic life with the West, with the US. Uh, but they're building a world capable Air Force and Navy with, with which, and by which legitimate to support their, what they feel are their national security uh, risks. Uh, but it's one that for, to maintain deterrence over the coming 20 years, uh, we need to stay two generations in advance of them on military technology and we're not. So I'd say weapons of mass destruction to include cyber and how do you continue to create deterrence to China and the Pacific Rim are the two concerns uh, that I would call your attention to. Well, now I, I should have mentioned, uh, first of all, thank you very much for the plug about my books. Uh, but second, that uh, those of uh, our classmates who are uh, attending today, and I see we have 26, 25, uh, please submit questions uh, to the chat room. Or um, Judy, could, could we do hand raising? Would that be possible? We can certainly uh, do that, or they can um, chat you or I directly in the chat. Uh huh. Okay. Um, well, if um, uh, if I could throw out a question of my own, what what do you make of the situation in uh, Afghanistan and the uh, likely results of our unconditional withdrawal? Well, you know, Afghanistan and Iraq, I've been in and out of both war zones uh, since, the, since after 9-11 as, as a civilian. So, and I'd never go in as, a, as an NBC person. I'd never go in as a contractor, but I'd get sponsored by Council on Foreign Relations or, you know, you name it. I, I've done a lot of global visits trying to understand national security and Afghanistan, fascinating to me. And I was in there right after the initial intervention sat with the ambassador in our bombed out embassy. There was a rug on the floor with giant pools of dried blood. And they turned into from a primitive society. They had destroyed the entire country. It was incredible. There, wouldn't, there weren't two bricks standing one on another. Now I've got TV stations and universities and a, a, a legislative body of sorts and a brand new building and on and on and on of security forces and um, and it's all in peril. Now, you know, I, my, who knows what will happen. The Taliban right now are, uh, have uh, organized themselves uh, pretty effectively. They, uh, they're a pretty effective institution. They're effective fighters. Uh, the central government, that's a balkanized country. You know, it's just the Pashtun are the Taliban, the Hazaras, the, you know, Turkic people and it's just a balkanized society. There's no central concept. It's always been held together by intrigue and cruelty. And um, it was pretty successful in, in earlier in the, you know, the 20th century, not so, not so now. So a, a lot of progress has been there. The central government is incompetent beyond belief and corrupt. Uh, so are the security forces. It's probable, it seems to me, that it's going to revert to all-out civil war, which is going to be a tragedy. Millions of people, should this turn out, will flee into the Central Asian republics or into, uh, into uh, Iran or, or uh, into Pakistan. Uh, the tenuous situation of women and girls will evaporate overnight. Uh, it's a tragedy. Now, having said that, uh, you know, what are the alternatives politically uh, for Biden and his administration? Uh, the alternatives, it seemed to me, were two. What he did or to announce to the Taliban and the world, we're going to stay there for 35 years if that's what it takes. We're going to stay with 25,000 U.S. NATO forces and stabilize it. It's only going to be 10 to $15 billion a year, not much money. Uh, we're not going to take many casualties. We're not taking many casualties. Uh, and if he had taken that route, uh, the Taliban in another 10 years would have dwindled to a small force. But politically, there is no support 
in my view, for that course of action. So Biden did, on a, I think, from a political viewpoint, an appropriate uh, thing. And by the way, one of the problems with Afghanistan is, you know, Americans over time ought to, by and large, only use military power where we have a vital national security interest at stake. And it's hard to make that argument in Afghanistan. There is no vital U.S. national security threat. I mean, the fact that it might be a haven for terrorism is certainly a strong a reason to, to uh, try and prop up a somewhat law-based state. But so I, I think, uh, I think Biden doing the only thing that can be done, and we're likely to see an unraveling of the country and a giant tragedy ensue. Uh huh. So. Uh but now you mentioned that it's politically um, difficult to maintain any troop level, but 25,000 is, is a substanti fairly substantial number. But how many are there now? 7,000? 2,500 and going fast. And yeah, well, uh, there's 7,000 NATO and about 20,000 contractors, a lot of them from you know Eastern European states, uh, but just enough to hold it together. 2,500 20, US was too small a number uh, from the start. And by the way, it's always amused me uh, what the political Congress and the White House will do is argue over things like numbers instead of arguing over missions. What is it you want to achieve in Afghanistan? What are your political objectives? And then tell the JCS, figure out what the military strategy and diplomatic strategy and treasury strategy and agriculture and use aid to support those political objectives. And then let the, the, the soft power and military power of the United States design an appropriate outcome. That didn't want to happen. They, they argue over 2,500 versus 3,200. It's just ridiculous. Mm -hmm. The right number in Afghanistan, if we're going to stay forever, probably 25, 35,000 US. Mm -hmm. NATO is going to leave immediately as we pull out. And by the way, the embassy, I, I, I've been in that embassy over the dozen times over the years, and uh, I don't see how, <laughs> because as we leave, you know, it's not just the Taliban, it's the abandoned uh, Afghan security forces and militias who will turn on us. So we are a four star over there, uh, Scotty Miller spent half his life in, in JSOC and Delta Force globally. He's a wonderful, smart, cagey guy. I hope we can get out of there without having a humiliating disaster as we pull out. Well, if there is some fear that the helicopters will be hovering over the embassy roof, uh, a la 1975. Um, do you think that's- well, It won't be hovering over the embassy. You're not coming out of that city. No. Uh, be hovering over uh, Bagram Airfield. No. Um, but do you suspect that that's likely to happen? Who knows? I think so. But, you know, normally I tell people in the intelligence community, don't tell me about the intentions of adversarial forces, talk about their capabilities. Right. And the capabilities are as, as we withdraw intelligence, special ops, and air power that can operate inside Afghanistan, uh, it's likely that the uh, police, uh, Afghan national police, and the armed forces, which are now sustaining huge casualties. The last three years, we haven't been doing the fighting. They have been completely. And, and uh, they're trying to hold the whole countryside and isolated 30 man police detachments. And uh, so they've been getting their clocks clean regularly. And they're, now their recruitment's faltering. I think it's more likely to revert to regional civil war again with warlords and the Pashtun, the Taliban will who are also, by the way, in major numbers, as many of you know, in Pakistan. Uh, you know, the Duran line was drawn by some partially drunk Brit diplomat uh, purposely to divide the Pashtun. <laughs> and that don't work. So some of these national lines don't make a lot of sense. The, the allegiances tend to be tribal and ethnic more than national. Uh -huh. Well, and. Uh to the news about Turkey um, and the, the, the president deciding to uh, acknowledge that the Ottoman Empire committed genocide um, against the Armenians. Um, 
during World War I. Um, what do you make of that decision? And uh, what does that uh, portend for our foreign policy decisions in the future? Well, I personally, it's, been a, it's astonishing how emotion actually can govern major global issues. People fight wars over the stupidest things imaginable. And denial of the Armenian genocide, silly. I mean, I, my grandmother always used to have us say a prayer for the starving Armenians uh, at every, every meal. And of course, that's what happened. So they're digging their heels, and they all did. Uh, was something. I don't think that'll have much of an impact. He's going to say we did the same thing to the U.S. Uh, Native American population. The bigger issue to me is uh, the secular state in Turkey, part of NATO, aspiring to EU membership. Um, I love Turkey. I've been in and out of there all my life. Uh, they're sophisticated, tough, smart, organized people. But a lot of it was a secular state. So now what will become of us Erdogan is gradually not just becoming an autocratic dictator and has ended free press. He's got the military under control. He's got the security forces. Uh, he's uh, using uh, Islam, I think, as a tool, uh, using the rural communities. Uh, they're just going in, going in the wrong direction. It's sort of sad. I, I don't see how they make it in the longer run uh, as a alienated society. They say their friends are Russia. Now, nah, come on. You know, history governs mankind more than, you know, CNN's uh, daily story. And uh, so Turkey's going to be a, a great loss, but I, I don't see how the uh, Erdogan gets stopped. Well, the, the larger implication, I think, of the decision to uh, acknowledge the uh, the, the genocide that did take place is the notion that we should re, uh, re more emphasize heavily, more heavily the uh, issue of morality and foreign policy and defense policy. Oh, I think Biden did the, exactly the right thing. I, I, we should have done that 20 years ago. I mean, right. it, uh, we were intimidated by excessive overthinking of the diplomatic implications. Now, I, did, I do think it will enrage the Turkish leadership and Erdogan will use it. Uh, but it was exactly the right thing for Biden to do. You're going to see a lot. Mostly we're going to go back to a values-based approach to foreign policy and domestic issues. Uh, you know, it, there's, everything's not right about the Biden administration. But these are experienced, high-integrity people, uh, and they'll try and govern from a sense of American values and the Constitution. So, Mm -hmm. That's just another good thing that uh, Biden has done is to make a seemingly bold move to recognize Armenian genocide. Mm -hmm. And then what, what particular implications do you think it would have for, for immediate foreign policy decisions that, uh, would, that uh, would be more heavily emphasizing the, uh, the role of morality? How about Saudi Arabia, for example? Well, Saudi Arabia, I think I put almost put the Armenian genocide aside to, to the extent that Biden did the right thing. That's it. Let, let Erdogan figure out how he's going to use it. And something will happen. It's not going to be important. Saudi Arabia uh -huh. has a difficult situation. I've been in and out of Saudi Arabia for, for years, and uh, I like dealing with them, you know, more so than most, almost any of the Middle Eastern countries. Five-star hotel, you're not going to get mugged. Uh, you got a driver to take your next appointment. Everyone speaks English. Everybody got a propped up degree from University of California, all the princes. Uh, so they speak English. They're, um, they're keenly aware of their status in life depends upon U.S. Uh, embrace of the, of the kingdom. And it made sense for a lot of years. Um, and in terms of brutality and autocratic regimes, they're way off the, you know, the leading contenders. Now, the MBS got in there, and that thing, the murder of Khashoggi uh, up in their consulate in, in Turkey was an astonishing display of uh, murder by the state, by MBS himself. And we, we should have, um, regardless of the consequences, had major reaction to it. Uh, because the guy was a U.S. resident, he was a U.S. journalist, 
he got deliberately <clears throat> sawed up by our murder squad. And uh, of course, MBS has been doing the same thing. He arrested ha half the princes with their billionaires, stuck them in the Four Seasons Hotel. Uh, one of the wealthy two-star National Guard generals got beat to death. Uh, he's a real brute. He got involved in a stupid war in Yemen. So, and by the way, fracking, I, I was, you know, is taking us away from any sense of vital national security interests in Middle Eastern oil. Saudi Arabia still got more of it than almost anywhere, and it's easiest to get it out of the ground. And yes, they're part of the global oil economy, but uh, as we move to, uh, you know, renew uh, renewable sources of energy, uh, Saudi Arabia is going to not be primary. Now, we, that doesn't mean we walk away and we focus our entire foreign policy on Khashoggi's murder, but uh, but MBS was out of control, needs to be pushed back into line, needs to be told in no uncertain terms, uh, we won't stand with you if you uh, violently oppress your own population. Who knows what's going to happen in Saudi Arabia? It's still important to us. We still have to have a balanced view of our self-interest there. Okay, well, Ed Wall has a question. Funky, are, are you with us still? That's, uh, yes, I am. Um, yeah. By either name. Um, yeah, Barry, thank you very much. I was interested, going back to the Armenian uh, question, do you think the Armenian recognition of the Armenian genocide is a message to the Kurds that uh, the US will support uh, minority groups in uh, Turkey? And is it also a message in a sense to China that we will eventually end up supporting the Uyghurs uh, from a human rights and morality issue? It's a, it's a symbolic uh, system or a symbolic uh, uh, action that has ramifications in other parts of the world. Well, I, I think the answer is yes. Uh, again, I think the Biden team, you're going to see a values based foreign policy to the extent they can. They're going to be realists. They got a lot of experience. Um, <clears throat> they're also, anybody who's dealt with foreign policy, national security policy, has to under, even though we're still the most powerful force on earth, has to recognize the incredible tiny impact we can have on certain problems. Certainly certain problems using military force, but also uh, any attempt to use our other tools, economic constraints or whatever. So um, I spent a lot of time being with the Kurds and one of our Andover uh, grads or young woman, is fabulous, spent a lot of time there. She and I have been talking about the Kurdish influence. Of course, the Kurds are all over the map. They're in Syria, uh, Turkey, uh, Iraq, Iran. They've been an oppressed minority. They're beautiful people. You can fly into northern, uh, the Kurds in northern Iraq won't let the Iraqi army back in there for a thousand years. Uh, it was astonishing, the, the terrible trauma they suffered from Saddam. Uh, outright murder, chemical weapon attacks on villages, etc. So you fly into northern uh, Iraq and the Kurdish, the two major Kurdish towns up there, it looks like a landing in Dallas, you know, the direct flights from Vienna. And, uh, they're smart people. They love the Americans. They love the American armed forces. Our guys, when we had a big presence in Iraq, the soldiers were always sneaking away to drive up there into to spend a weekend in the Kurdish zones where they could, you know, go swim in a pool and meet some girls and stuff like that. And it's just, so the, the Kurds are uh, very impressive people. Um, but I don't think you're going to see muscular approaches by the Biden administration to intervening to protect oppressed minorities. They're all over the world. I mean, these poor Rohingya in, in uh, Myanmar. Another genocide situation being slaughtered. Uh, by the way, you can get meaner and meaner about this. If you look at India and Modi and the Hindu oppression of the Muslim, uh, I wouldn't even call it a minority. I, India is something like the third biggest Muslim nation in the world. And Modi is making these terrible uh, changes uh, to diminish their rights. So you got to have a sense of proportion. Uh, on what is achievable. I, I spent a lot of time in Latin America and 
you know, most and have a lot of friends there and great admiration and, and uh, for that matter, affection for things Latino and in, in South America in particular. And, you know, but if, if you talk to an intelligent college graduate in Bogota, uh, I might hear a, a question like, this year, will the CIA or the DEA allow the corn crop to come up? I mean, it was that level of silliness. And I'd say, here's an unclassified figure. We have 20 DEA people in this country. And so the, the law enforcement, which doesn't deal with corn, uh, is pretty minimal. And the same with the agency. I mean, God, you know, I, I don't know. So we need to take a modest view of what we can achieve with direct intervention in other countries affairs. Mostly what we need to do is build coalitions of like-minded like -minded people, the rule of law, democratic values. That certainly means first priority is the European Union, the Japanese, the South Koreans, the Australians, New Zealand. They're the easiest to deal with. They may have differing objectives, but they're people that uh, we can deal with easily. And then we get in the more difficult ground. Uh, you know, an interventionist policy over time is, is hopefully going to be dramatically constrained. The country's sick of the Afghan and Iraq wars. Uh, they went a long time. Nobody knows what they achieved. We had uh, 60,000 killed and wounded. A lot of Americans don't realize there's an actual war going on in Afghanistan and Iraq. I mean, it was uh, brutal fighting and Ramadi as, as much as, uh, you know, in Tarawa for the U.S. Marines. And uh, anyway, we're going to have, have to be realist, uh, but we should have a values-based foreign policy. And uh, we need to reestablish our coalitions of like-minded nations. Um, Mike, the chat is disabled. You might take a look at that. And Nick Danford has his hand up. And I use my raised hand technique down below. To oh, get oh okay. Um, I'm, I'm, sure, uh, I'll take a look at that. Okay, but uh, who was that? Alan? Alpha? Oh no, Alan Ward. Okay, Alan. Yes. Yeah. Go ahead, Alan. Uh, uh, Barry. Uh, the situation with China is, as you say, one of the biggest challenges. If if China makes a move on Taiwan, what happens? Well, I spent a lot of time in the last um, year looking at that and listening to people with different viewpoints. Uh, one friend of mine is a, a very senior intelligence officer who, who watches it very closely, insists the Chinese have put into place the military power to seize Taiwan in the coming year and will do so. So put a data point on the far end for that one. He's a very knowledgeable, stable guy. On the other end, I was just out in Hawaii and I spent a day with the uh, Pacific Security Center. It's got a longer name than that, Daniel and in a wave Security Center for the Pacific. And it's a couple of hundred, it's a, the Marshall Center in Europe, DOD run for the Pacific. And the, the uh, director is this wonderful man. Uh, God, what an impressive two-star retired admiral. He's got an incredible faculty assembled. Uh, everyone in the Pacific comes there for conferences. They run conferences all over the So I asked the director, I said, what do you think? Are the Chinese gonna try and snag Taiwan in the coming year or five? He said, absolutely not. There's another data point on the, <laughs> on the other extreme. I think the, um, a lot of things in the global community can never be solved. And so your primary strategy ought to be to wake up each day and say, today, how can I push off decisions so that nobody goes to military power, nobody makes a final determination on where they're going to go in the future. You just push off decisions. Certainly the Palestinian-Israeli uh, is one example of it, and Taiwan's another. It doesn't make much sense for the uh, People's Republic to invade and try and seize China. First of all, we are unpredictable. I have no clue uh, if there was a major military assault. By the way, we see it coming. 
uh, and we'd start worrying about it and leaking the press and talking about it. I have no idea what we actually do. If we committed the power of the US Navy and the US Air Force, the Chinese would lose their military force trying to cross the, uh, to get into Taiwan, probably. So, you know, if I was a private advisor to President Xi, I'd say, sir, this is not a good idea. And by the way, there's a tremendously close relationship between those, those two countries. Taiwanese singers and you know, are in Chung, Chengdu. You know, I, I was over there and I heard this great voice coming, booming out over the city. And what, what's that? Well, to try, uh, Taiwanese in Hong Kong and Singapore Chinese go to drug treatment centers in mainland China. So there's, all, there's always this incredible sort of not publicly recognized integration of their economies and their concerns. I don't think it's gonna happen, but I don't, and ambiguous is, has served us well for a long time. We, we try and not say what we do, where we stand. Uh, Trump, Trump, who I, if there isn't, there could be more than 50 people in the country that were more critical of Trump. Uh, than, than I was, an uh, absolute buffoon, ignorant uh, man. Having said that, some of the things they did right. And uh, we need to make sure Taiwan has uh, self-defense capabilities, modern aircraft, that kind of thing. The Chinese are threatening us unbelievably. You'd better not do that or we'll act. Um, so who, hard to know. I don't think they're I think Hong Kong is going to come completely under their national security and legal domination. Yeah. Democracy in Hong Kong is over. I'm not sure that its status as a economic engine for China is any, it's not as valuable as it used to be. Uh, mm -hmm. Shanghai is more likely to be the economic capital of China mm -hmm. than Hong Kong. So a lot of the brain power kids are going to get out of Hong Kong, go move to the UK or elsewhere. Uh -huh. Well, we have a question from Ned Levitt, uh, and Ned wants to know, given the threats to the integrity of the vote, do you see any scenario in which the military is forced to respond to protect democracy from a coup attempt, either through voter suppression or from white supremacists and right-wing activists similar to January 6th? No. Uh -huh. Okay, next question. <laughs> Wally. Uh, Barry, uh, turning to uh, something we haven't talked about, which um, I know Nick Danforth is going to ask you about this too, but during your five years as a director of the Office of National Drug Control Policy, I'm wondering, um, during that time, I'm reading the book about Purdue Pharma and the Sackler family, and uh, I'm wondering how aware were you at that time that uh, the opioid epidemic was being fueled by uh, Purdue Pharma and, uh, and, and the Sackler family. This book recently about uh, what they knew and which was a lot about how this drug was decimating people in our country is really quite remarkable. And I'm just wondering how much of this you knew at the time. Well, a little complicated. First of all, I'm biased. I just signed a letter with several other major medical authorities, all of us who have experience in the drug field, to, uh, and we actually have had some impact on FDA and CDC uh, guidance on it. Uh, after the great, uh, you know, OxyContin and the synthetic opioid thing, uh, Congress moved rapidly to interject political decision-making on individual physicians. And I am, have been a professional patient. Uh, the worst thing I ever had to do is get my hemorrhoids removed as a Lieutenant Colonel. I've been wounded three times, mangled, spindled. Uh, we all, uh, I was sort of surprised I survived it. We all knew we were gonna die, uh, but we didn't wanna be in intractable pain. So we were all for intelligent use of pain management techniques, which is very done very poorly. Along came time-released analgesics like OxyContin. 
And we were thrilled. Now we've gone to Zippo. And so every doctor is terrified of a visit from the DEA that says you wrote 1,100, you wrote 23 prescriptions. What are you up to? And so they're not doing it. So your Aunt Jane with you know, brain cancer is more likely to be in terrible shape. And by the way, here's another one. It just outrages the current thinking is, you know, by and large, uh, our studies used to be absolutely conclusive. People don't end up addicted when they go in and get nasal cancer surgery and they're on opioids for three to seven days. That's nonsense. Uh, that's the, uh, who's that? Rush Limbaugh just died. God, you know, the doctor made me do it. Uh, mostly when you're taking uh, analgesics in a medical environment, uh, you, don't, you, you do have a physiological withdrawal, uh, but you don't go out in the street and start looking for heroin. Mostly that's just not the case. So we're worried about medical management of pain also. Now, having said that, I think it was clear that the pharma, big pharma said, we're making a fortune off this stuff. At some point, it was clear they were shipping way in excess which, of what could have possibly been medically generated. You know, there were towns in West Virginia where there were 2,000 people in town that they were getting barrels of OxyContin. Florida was the capital of the diverted uh, pain medication. Uh, just a nightmare. But there were three levels in that. And by the way, the Sacklers and the big pharma had the money. So all of you who are lawyers would understand you follow the money when you're doing it. So I think a lot of people have offloaded uh, all the um, problem on, I, I don't know anything about the Sacklers personally, but I do know big pharma was aggressively selling more than they should have been. Then there were the regional distributors who clearly should have known better that they were shipping to tiny outfits. And then finally, this is a difficult one to say, every town has a crooked doctor. And at the end of the day, mostly, you had to go to a doc and get a prescription. And they were physician shopping. So they were going to seven doctors. And uh, we, had tr we were trying to get one national or at least regional standards on so you could look up McCaffrey and see anybody's prescription to me. We never could get any of that through. So the Sackler's taken a punch in the gut, okay by me, but boy, there were a lot of people involved in that. And you and I as older guys definitely want sensible pain management as, as we run into medical problems. Absolutely. Now, did I see, did Ward Rickwire, did you have a question? Oh, no, or Jeremy, excuse yeah, me. Jerry, um, there was a, uh, a world leader who made a presentation to the United Nations. And just a brief quote, he said, the future does not belong to the globalists. Now he's in deep retirement right now, but I wondered what your thought is on the whole field of globalization. There are papers that are written condemning it, saying it's dead, and there are papers saying this is the hope of the future. You know, <laughs> I tell you, some of these questions are so complicated in reality, so easy to come up with a cute uh, response. Um, I, you know, I, I'm a child of people that grew up and all of us are, the depression. So I have a, my instinct is to trust and like unions and to be concerned about manufacturing jobs in the middle class and all that sort of thing. It's clear to me that globalization has ill served many national subpopulations and that what drove it was profit, nothing else. I was with an unbelievably high integrity engineering design firm for years. Uh, we had 5,000 smartest kids in America work for us. We were designing cutting edge uh, transportation and you know systems and we start outsourcing stuff and by the way it doesn't work all that well uh, in some cases you run your back office out of 
uh, the Philippines with people who barely speak English, it, it doesn't work well for your banking. Or, so globalization did, you know, the other hand, I was a great proponent of NAFTA and its follow on. Mexico, Canada, the United States, sort of a common market. It definitely destroyed jobs in America and certain kinds of in industries. But as a general statement, all three nations benefited from it enormously. You just have to, it seems to me, have rule makers dealing with China. Some, one of my friends is a dentist, a major manufacturer of dental instruments. He gets all of it made in China. The only thing here is his representation and management. And he said, you know, he said with China, he said, I go over there, they're all my friends. They take me to their homes. I know all their kids. Uh, I, when they tell me they're gonna do something, we shake on it, we've got a bond. But he said, the only thing they won't, uh, they, and so they won't steal my technology and sell back into the US market, but they'll sell my technology out the door the next day in Asia. Uh, so we better, and the Chinese are the biggest economic theft threat to the United States time 10 that exists. Uh, so you have to have a rule maker. And, uh, I bemoan outsourcing. I, I think we need to have uh, somebody put their, their fingers on the scale periodically and, and make sure that, to include in national security issues, I don't want to see anything put in the national security system that's made in China, period. And you turn around and we found them, they were making our uniforms. <laughs> um, but, and what's driving that? Nothing but profit. If you can cut the cost in half or more, uh, more power to you. Now, Chinese wages are rising. That's an advantage. Now, a lot of that stuff's moving to Vietnam, Bangladesh, uh, and elsewhere. But globalization has not served some nations equitably. The people that suffered were the middle class, the working class. The elites always benefit. Barry, we have a question about Vietnam. Many of us think of Vietnam as the worst foreign policy of our generation, a terrible waste of human life and American money. So how to explain that we repeated the same tragic mistakes in the Middle East? Well, Mon and I had an exchange of emails on this. You know, I, uh, a lot of my life tied up in Vietnam. I had three and a three pieces of tours in Vietnam. I've been back three times. I speak, I spoke Vietnamese. I, you know, I have great admiration for the culture and the, I still get a lot of friends. In July, I'll be at a big meeting of the Vietnamese Airborne Division. We've had an association. We uh, stayed friends for all these 50 years. Um, you know, I, one of my trips, I took a bunch of Vietnam veterans back to uh, as the chair of the Vietnam Veterans Memorial Fund. And we started in Hanoi and uh, there's a genuine affection. But nobody, no American in Vietnam ever has a bit of trouble uh, or feels unwelcome in Vietnam. They love us. They send their kids here to school. Uh, uh, it's just an astonishing close association between the two countries. But it was a historical tragedy. And you can certainly in retrospect, go back and say, we had OSS teams parachuted into Vietnam and were with uh, Ho Chi Minh and, and Jap, uh, 44 and 45, and they stayed on in the 46. And if Roosevelt hadn't died, uh, who knows, if he'd had another two or three years, he was vehemently against the colonial powers reestablishing themselves. And so uh, we were trying to keep the French out of Indochina. The Brits brought them back in, uh, bastards, they provided the shipping and so there's a tortured history of that, but Ho Chi Minh uh, had written Roosevelt a couple of times and had uh, said, uh, essentially, yeah, we're communists, but we aspire to liberty and the revolutionary ideas behind your own country. And uh, then he died in a, and w what ended up being wrapped up in it was a global confrontation with communism. And so Vietnam is a tragedy, you know, essentially 58,000 killed, 303,000 wounded, uh, a tremendous division in America. Uh, the country finally said, uh, the politicians don't know what they're doing. They have no strategy to achieve anything. They're 
grinding up our boys to no purpose. And so we turned off the spigot and left and they went under predictably in very short order. There's not a lot to be uh, proud about uh, in, in, in that uh, conflict. But on the other hand, you know, the communists up north came in and put all my friends and the Vietnamese armed forces into concentration camps and cut their heads off and kept them for 10, 12 years and half of them died. And finally, they, a lot of the population fled at sea or through the jungles into Thailand. So the regime that replaced them uh, was really effective and brutal. And now it's gotten corrupt and not all that competent. So that was a tragedy. Now, how much does it relate to Afghanistan and Iraq? Not much. The ending in Afghanistan, I think, is going to have some political realities domestically in the United States that look a lot like Vietnam. We've had a couple of million troops serve in Afghanistan. which shed a lot of blood there. Uh, they did set up a state. It was mission creep uh, par excellence. Uh, they trying to impose a rule of law on a tribal society. And so, but I think the reasons, what, you know, it, it, I've been in, in three administrations in Washington uh, at the highest levels and sort of watch how things actually get get done and, and what we normally are doing, there's always a thousand issues out there, a thousand that are uh, important to us. And we, I used to tell people, I spent a lot of Saturday mornings in the National Security Council working till four in the afternoon. And what we could do is three issues at the same time, that's it. And the National Security Council the, the several hundred officers in the NSC, the Foreign Service officers, uh, the uh, CIA guys, uh, the uh, JCS um, lieutenant colonels, you're dealing with the smartest people in our society. And they're incredibly competent in the fields they represent. Uh, you know, people talk about what, what do we know about the culture of Vietnam or culture of Afghanistan? Everything. <laughs> Everything. We have people that grow up and spend most of their life. You go in an embassy and the political officer and the agency guy, they all speak the language. They've been, they're on their fourth tour there. I was up at Harvard doing a lecture. This always amuses me. <clears throat> National security lecture. And there's maybe 70 people in the room and it was the Balkans. So I was a JCS strategic planner. I was supposed to help Powell and the president and the Congress understand the Balkans. What should we do? And this bright eyed 40 year old is tearing my ass up with questions. And do I understand the Serbs and the, you know, the Croatians and the Muslims and the Christians? And finally said, hey, spare me. There isn't anything I don't know about the Balkans. I have been to every corner of the Balkans. I've talked to all their leaders on every side of the issue. I've studied their history. The only thing I don't know about the Balkans is what should we do about it? So if you have some ideas along those lines, be sure and share them with me. And that's normally the problem with these things. We look at a problem, by the way, it's accentuated now by social media and the cable news and the, the immediate feedback of information and the legitimate role of politics, of you know, which the president, vice president and congressman are take into account. They're posturing or they actually believe strongly in something. So uh, our system produces uh, slow decisions and sometimes they're wrong, but it certainly isn't because nobody in, in Washington, D.C. <laughs> knows where Venezuela is. Uh, Jeremy. Afghanistan, when I was a lieutenant colonel in the Army War College, one of the many three-day problems was intervention in Northwest Pakistan and Afghanistan. And here were a bunch of bright-eyed guys with tremendous experience in our own fields. We came out of that three-day mini thing and 100% of us said, never on a bet would we intervene militarily in Northwest Pakistan or Afghanistan. And, and it wasn't because we Think, thought we'd do the same thing the Russians did. We said, it just doesn't make any sense to go way up there 
there's no national, final national security interest. It's too hard. Don't do it. Don't ever use military power. So when 9-11 happened and we said, hey, that's we wanted retribution. That's how we got into Afghanistan to knock these people on the head. We did that pretty effectively. Then we stayed to create a modern state, a Swiss democracy in the in the region and it didn't work. Jeremy, did you have a question? Oops, muted. Somebody's muted. Yeah, you're, you're muted, Jeremy. Hello? Yep. Yes, go on. There I am? Yep. Yeah. Okay, my question is follows. We were taught at Andover by a, a cadre of people who had experienced uh, the Second World War, and in some cases, maybe the First World War, all of whom had been subject to conscription. And uh, up until the time of Vietnam, uh, everybody had to serve. And I think the fact that the draft was uh, done away with, which allowed a lot of people essentially to uh, avoid service, uh, changed uh, how people see the world in that uh, a lot of us were, uh, you know, a lot of us didn't go to Vietnam for various reasons. Uh, in some cases, we didn't get picked, but the experience of our fathers and the cadre of people that taught us was that they were thrown in with everybody and they had to work together to, you know, team sport. Uh, that's gone. Uh, I think that uh, may affect our politics a lot in that a lot of people don't have to face out uh, military service and what that might entail. And a lot of the decision making is made by people who avoided service or now can avoid service owing the way things are. Anyway, long-winded comment. Well, you know, we um, sort of an odd reaction. I, my re company reunion is every two years in November. B Company, 2nd Battalion, 7th Cav, 100% uh, draftees. The lieutenants mostly were two years of college, uh, drank too much beer, got bad grades, the local draft board. That's who the lieutenants were. First Sergeant and I were the only two regular army guys, tremendous soldiers. We love each other. They were 19, 18, 20. Uh, so uh, that's who, you know, at the height of the Vietnam War, 14% of the armed forces were draftees. When you went to Vietnam, 25% of the forces in country were draftees. When you went to a rifle company in combat, to include the Marines in the last three or four years of the war, you might find 100% of the riflemen were draftees. So the whole system of the armed forces was manned by draft avoidance, avoidance of ground combat units, avoidance of service in Vietnam. And if you lost all those bets, you ended up in my company. <laughs> and we essentially were in horrendous levels of combat. We, over time, it'd be 100% killed and wounded, mostly lightly wounded. Mostly if you got alive on a helicopter, you'd end up with a decent life, but it's a pretty stiff fight. And uh, it was draftees that did it. So we loved the draftees, absolutely did. The problems of indiscipline were the volunteers on the fire bases and the drugs and that sort of thing. Now, having said that, when you know, we, if you, if you had asked 100% of my Army War College class, 19, God, what was it, 76, um, if you'd asked 100% of us, do you believe in, uh, in universal military service, we would all said yes. And then they started a sub element of the course on studying universal service. And at the end of it, 100% of us were against it. And uh, we're certainly that way now. The kids, we, we're actually recruiting the top 20% of American males into the armed forces, the top 15% of American females, no felony arrests, high school graduates, nice kids. By and large, uh, we make our goals. 
Um, they get paid decent package compensation. They're developed. Once we get our reenlistment rates are sky high. We love these troops. They're the best fighting people we ever had in uniform. And so we're hard pressed <laughs> to go argue for the draft. Uh, Charlie Rangel, who I always loved, Korean War vet, raspy voice. Uh, you know, there's mixed views about Charlie, I understand that, but he'd been a draftee in Korea. And uh, he was always talking about uh, if you Republicans wouldn't keep starting all these wars and drafting us poor, uh, poor folk to fight them, uh, this country would be better off. And then he'd call for a return to the draft. <laughs> and it was all political nonsense. We will have a draft again if the country gets in a serious struggle for our survival in every war. The only, once you guys start getting huge casualties, you got to have the incentive of the draft to cause the volunteers to come in. Uh, and by the way, we got a lot of kids that will volunteer to fight. It's just amazing. I see them all, I've seen them for the last 15 years in and out of Iraq and Afghanistan. They're just tremendous kids. And uh, they paid a price too. So there won't be a draft. Uh, it's not going to happen. What we need to do is start registering women though. My older daughter, who's a major in the National Guard and served five years in active duty, adamant, if you're gonna have her two sons register for the draft, she wants other people's daughters registering for the draft. And I think we should do it. Barry, we have another question. Can you comment on the national security issues related to synthetic biology, including the use of CRISPR and other genetic engineering tools for dual use purposes? And how do you manage those risks? Boy, that's a question. You know, I've, I've been in and out of the biological warfare world. I was with the Secretary of State and we signed the BWC in Paris. Uh, I, I, used to, I, mean, I was trying to help negotiate this treaty with the global community on why biological weapons didn't make any sense. And I'd, I'd go into uh, the, the, the community that dealt with that issue and said, give me all the arguments against why biological weapons don't make any sense. And I'd get back hundreds of pages of the devastating impact of BW uh, when used in terrorism and on and on. And say, hey, fellas, I got to go talk to the Russians. What do I tell them is the reason why neither one of us supports BWC. And by the way, that was before in today's day and age, we have high school kids doing gene splicing. So should we be worried about biological warfare? Oh my God, of course we should. And that means global communities of oversight and awareness. I mean, just watching this Wuhan uh, laboratory and we're paying some of the bills and do we know what they're actually up to? And, uh, and by the way, everybody's continuing to do in, the, in all these nations. I, I think I could be wrong. Everybody's gotten rid of active BW stocks. However, Everybody's continuing to do research on what happens if a new actor comes in and modifies the dengue fever or, you know, you name it. There's supposedly there's only two stockpiles of smallpox live virus left in the U.S. and Russia. Uh, but is, is that the case? Is somebody else going to modify uh, smallpox virus? So it's a huge concern, uh, not for anybody rational. I think anybody that has, you know, some major in the Iranian Revolutionary Guards, if the, if the Ayatollah said, is this a good idea? You've got a PhD, we sent you to school in the UK. Uh, I think he'd say, no, it doesn't make much sense. But terrorism, it's something to worry about. Then we have a comment uh, apropos of your uh, uh, observation that we have knowledgeable people uh, dealing with foreign countries. Uh, our Andover friend, Jerry Bremer, knew very little about Iraq. So is he the exception to the rule? Well, uh, apparently uh, Rumsfeld knew very little about Bremer. <laughs> 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 that, was, that was an astonishing period where- Is that Rumsfeld sort of a chain of command thing? What? Chain of command thing. 
No, I mean, I heard Rumsfeld on TV. By the way, I went after Rumsfeld tooth and tongue for years and paid a price for it too. But I, <laughs> I tell people, I said, when, when the history is written, I want it to be known that in a small way, I helped bring Rumsfeld down. But what an interesting man. He, uh, arrogant, wouldn't listen to anybody. Uh, Bremer uh, was a failure of leadership and uh, the government was a failure of coordinated policy. I actually have got in later years, I've been on speaking platforms with President Bush the Younger. Shouldn't have been in that job. But my heart goes out to him. Uh, Cheney, who I used to think very highly of, I think he had here amateur doctor's diagnosis. He had brain problems and some, to some extent. And Rumsfeld pushed people around. So the end of, a, of the uh, Iraq intervention, which I supported and still do, but we screwed it up. So we got in there and Bremer dismissed the armed forces. Uh, Bremer dismissed the, uh, the bureaucracy that were members of the Saddam's party, the Ba'athist party, and the country came apart. So the people that should have been and were originally down on their knees weeping with gratitude we were there the shiite majority the plurality the majority of the population uh turned on us too for religious and cultural reasons and then we so we pulled out all our combat forces chaos ensued uh we started abusing the population with stupid military attack uh, tactics rounding up with some uh, id we go up we round up all the Iraqi boys blindfold and throw them on a truck, humiliate them in front, stick them all in a camp together where they'd radicalize each other. Uh, I thought the intervention in Iraq and Afghanistan were both sensible policy choices, but you can't screw it up. And uh, Bremer was brilliant. Bremer had spent 30 years as a aide to famous men of our time. So he had no experience of being in charge of stuff. <laughs> he did not organize, and, and the military commander, as everybody flooded out, that stupid uh, CENTCOM commander, an army four-star, left a three-star in place. It was a young friend of mine, a, a wonderful battalion commander. We all loved him. He's a great family man. He didn't know what the hell he was doing. He became the military aide to Bremer. He wasn't really running the military part of the country. So the only one who figured out what was going on was Petraeus. He was the 101st Division commander. And uh, so it was a, a, a period of terrible leadership. Um, and then they all got scared. They started a, a policy of torturing the Al-Qaeda operatives that fell into our hands. They were uh, radicalizing the young uh, men of Iraq to some extent. I don't know. It was a Terrible, terrible follow-on to a, a successful military intervention. Just dumb, dumb stuff. But it, you didn't have to know a whole hell of a lot about Iraq to understand you can't dismiss the Iraqi armed forces and leave them and take, they had more generals times 15 than any other force in the face of the earth. They all had giant pensions and half of them lived up in Mosul. So we took away their pensions. But what do you think they're going to do? They went out and organized the uprising against the, the Americans. Bremer, uh, who's managed to escape much continuing scrutiny, <laughs> that went just off the rails. So I started criticizing that one. And boy, did I take some heat from Rumsfeld and his gang. Eventually, I kept going in and out of Afghanistan and Iraq. And I'd come back and I'd write these reports, which would go viral on the internet. And finally, Bush and Cheney start calling me back in there. And first thing I said, you got to get rid of Rumsfeld. He's killing you guys. And uh, I had a one on one with, with Cheney in the vice president's office. He actually had Scooter Libby sitting in the corner taking notes. I briefed Mr. Cheney and I told him, here's my views, and this guy's got to go. And, I told people when I came out of there, if I videotaped him secretly, I wouldn't have any incriminating evidence to hold on him. It he was very friendly to me. He said, yes, Barry, thank you for your views. And he'd go, mm, I see. And 
but there was never any, yeah, this guy's killing us. We just screwed it up. So Bremer, Lieutenant General um, Sanchez uh, and others didn't serve us well. And, and Rumsfeld was the architect of disaster. Now we have another question from um, Dorsey Gardner about Iraq. Wasn't the goal in Iraq to destroy the country for Israel? Wasn't that a great success for Israel? Uh, no, um, actually, it certainly wasn't a goal. <laughs> you, you can, depending on which intervention in Iraq you're talking about, what our actual logic was, the, uh, I think there was a widespread belief, which I shared, that Iraq was a, a threat to U.S. national interests uh, and regional interests, and that uh, so they had to be monitored, constrained. Saddam was a brutal dictator. Uh, he had an alliance with Jordan. Uh, so, so there was an, an argument that he was a huge threat. Uh, now, the military intervention in Iraq was clearly an elective choice. We didn't have to go to war with Iraq. There's a legitimate body of, uh, of evidence that, it, uh, that it, a different approach would have been far better for regional stability. But it, you know, if you're, um, if you were uh, a uh, anti-Israeli strategist, you could argue that the worst thing that ever happened to you was US intervention in Iraq and Afghanistan. So suddenly the two principal threats to Israel, the Iranians uh, and, uh, well, certainly the Iranians uh, were gone, you know? And so they could now focus full time instead of on countering uh, Iraq and Afghanistan, you could focus on the threats to Israel. Um, U.S. policy toward Israel is a whole nother body of, of mistakes. Uh, you know, every president in a row until Trump thought they could use diplomacy to bring peace to the Middle East. I have a lot of experience in and out of Israel dealing with the PLO. Uh, there's no more entrenched madness uh, than the Palestinian view that uh, that our whole life is built around destroying the Jews and getting back our land. And, and the Israelis, who are such competent, clever, courageous uh, people, aren't going to uh, agree to their extinction off the face of the earth. And so that's where it ends up. So none of the diplomacy, the Oslo agreements and that sort of thing have ever had a chance of succeeding. Uh, I don't know where all this goes. Um, I think Biden, uh, Trump caused this giant uproar. Uh, now you've got a new administration that will try and re-engage diplomacy, try and re-engage economic uh, support for the Palestinians and see if that can have that. And Trump, again, you know, a buffoon and a, and a monster in many ways, did get significant traction with getting the Sunni Muslim countries to deal in a different way with, with Israel. So I think you can argue that you know, the, the Middle East is safer today than it has been many times in its history. The Egyptians, the Saudis, the, uh, the, uh, the, the big powers in the region aren't gonna go after Israel. Uh, they're gonna see that covertly in many cases as a partnership that benefits them. Well, uh, and then Dorsey follows up, aren't we out to do the same thing to Iran that we did to Iraq? Well, I, I don't, I'm, I, I'm hard pressed to even understand the question. I don't know what that means. The, the Iranians, the, the only uh, national security interest at stake in Iran, uh, it's a huge sophisticated country. Uh, it's young people want to reestablish relationships with the West. Uh, they want freedom of travel, freedom of opportunity. They're stuck with a religious kleptocracy. They're stuck with the uh, revolutionary uh, uh, guards that, that are uh, essentially running half the businesses in the country and have an, a built-in incentive to uh, continue the, the nuclear weapons development. Uh, so Iran needs to be re-engaged with 
uh, diplomatic uh, uh, discussions. Uh, we need to open up the economy. Uh, we need to some way uh, step on our nuclear weapons production. <clears throat> They're one year from having a nuclear weapon in my view. So the minute they decide they can uh, develop the fissile material, they've got the delivery systems. It would be a year's work or so to have a viable nuclear force, at which way, point the threat level in the Middle East goes up sky high because the Israelis are going to target Iranian nuclear strike forces. And they're going to be on a hair trigger alert. They're not going to accept the first launch of, of 25 nukes by the Iranians. So it's not, if I was an advisor to the Ayatollah, I'd say, sir, do not develop a viable nuclear uh, weapons program uh, because you're, you're going to be a greater risk. So, you know, where are we going to go with all this? I don't know. It's uh, very difficult to see. And that's why we still are forced to deal with MBS and the Saudis who do have money diplomacy, and they do have a, a heft, a religious heft in them among the Sunni community in the Middle East. But, but there won't be a war with Iran. It doesn't make any sense from the Iranian viewpoint. They're choking on the economic constraint put in place by Trump. Uh, and so they've restarted their nuclear program, but they're inching it toward being a declared nuclear power. Uh, there's no sense to the Iranians of an all-out war. We would utterly destroy the country uh, in fairly short order, and no good would come of it. And by the way, in the process, the Iranians would destroy a lot of Saudi Arabia and go after Israel. So a war doesn't make any sense from anybody's viewpoint, and it's highly unlikely, except through miscalculation. Well, then an, an allied question is, uh, your concern about nuclear proliferation um, is, is uh, as a top item, it seems very reasonable. Um, uh, what about Israel signing the NPT? Uh, well, you know, there's a, I, I've been involved in nuclear weapons since I was a captain. I was a prefix five certified nuclear weapons effects officer. I've done, you know, as a three-star, I spent time negotiating these arms controls agreements with the Russians and you name it. Uh, there's a theology of nuclear deterrence and power. I was never part of it. People write multiple books on the impact of, uh, a couple of us, a guy named Miller and I were in private cahoots trying to back the Russians and the US off these insane levels of nuclear weapons. At one point, I think it was like 20,000 US nukes and 30,000 uh, Soviet nukes. And so we said, that doesn't make any sense. You know, but the answer, by the way, isn't one or none, but the answer is a lot less than that. They cause a flipping fortune uh, and they're dangerous. You got to keep control of them. So, um, so you know, the, the whole nuclear weapons issue was at one point we semi figured it out. We ended up with a stable nuclear relationship. Uh, now, not so much. I think the, the likelihood of the employment of nuclear weapons has gone up, not down. The consequences have gone from Armageddon, the end of the global community, uh, to devastating in a regional sense. What, what was that question that you started with, Mike? I'm sorry. I was, what, I mean, it was just a question. The actual wording is, why aren't we demanding that Israel sign the nuclear uh, non-proliferation treaty? It doesn't matter whether they sign it or not. I mean, the North Koreans, this is all background nuclear theology. The, the question is, the, the Israelis got two to 300 nukes, end classified figure. They are never going to do away with them. It's given them a unilateral ability to tell the Arab powers, if you mass on us and attack simultaneously, we'll use nuclear weapons. Now they put them on submarines, I believe, which is a smart move. So I think the the... They are existing, that's the deal. Um, if they sign the NPT, they're not gonna get rid of their weapons. And the, uh, by the way, I think Iraq, uh, Iran's gonna be de facto nuclear power. I, the treaty that uh, Trump walked away from was a very flawed document. They got what they could, not what they needed. <clears throat> it basically said in 15 years, they'll be a declared nuclear power. I don't, I'm not sure they can get much more than that anyway, but I think the Iranians are gonna end up as a nuclear power, which is gonna to be too bad, it's gonna to add to tension. 
but the global community needs to get back into an extended conversation of constraining, developing uh, reasons, legal and diplomatic and otherwise, why they don't make any sense. But Putin keeps threatening us. It always amuses the hell out of me. Uh, Russia is now a second tier military power. All it's got is nukes and oil. Uh, they're not much of a threat to Western Europe. Uh, he's a risk taker, he's impulsive, and what he'll have his legislators announce the autonomous nuclear torpedo that's going to swim up the Hudson River, blow and create a tsunami that rolls through a downtown Manhattan. Ow, oh, come on. Or a hypersonic missile that can come in from the south and evade our defenses. There is no defense against a U.S. nuclear response to a surprise attack, period. The boomers are out there. It may be three days later, but your civilization will disappear. So all this language, bellicose language about nuclear weapons bothers me a lot. Uh, you shouldn't say things like that. And uh, so I, I think it's controversial. So far, DOD's ignored me. But I, I think the U.S. ought to take unilateral lead. Biden is in a position to do this and say, we're going to constrain the U.S. president's unilateral power to employ nuclear weapons, period. We're going to state our new policy, put it in the law so it sounds more convincing, is no first use. And I think that will, to some extent, back off the miscalculation, uh, quote, uh, accidental launch, uh, a uh, nuclear capable unit commander who takes unilateral action. Um, so we got to start talking about nukes because the likelihood of their employment in the coming 20 years is higher by far, in my view, than the 50s and 60s. And what about North Korea and nukes? What, are we, what should we do about them? Beats me. You know, I've been following that issue for a long time. Um, when I was a JCS strategic planner, I said, I'm going to go figure out <clears throat> how the North Koreans make their decisions. So I consulted everybody and we've got tons of people that speak Korean bilingually and we l listen to them day and night. We've got academics like Dr. Cha, who has written, he knows everything in the world about the Koreans. And we watch North Korea as closely as we can. Um, and of course, now we transition poor young man, Kim Jong-un, and now we have to start over. How is he controlling? Who, who helps him in make decisions? Uh, how smart is he? Is How stable is he? Uh, <laughs> you know, he's, he's providing over, it's an, an army surrounded by an impoverished population. 30% of the males in the country are in the armed forces active or reserve. Uh, his first priority was to develop nuclear weapons. This is a primitive country, and they pulled it off. They have a viable nuclear strike force of probably 60 weapons and the delivery systems, uh, which will work fairly effectively, missile strikes as far out as uh, Guam. Uh, the strategic missiles they don't have yet. They may not, the nuke submarines, uh, uh, boomers, they're 25 years from getting. They're already built one and they're testing it uh, with subsurface launches. Uh, so what do you get them to, to do? One thing I would uh, sort of assert, and this is, this is a controversial viewpoint. I think the good news about North Korea is that it's primarily a criminal regime. And when Kim Jong-un wakes up in the morning, the only thing he's taught, thinking about is regime survival. So in the 80s, a million people died of starvation. He didn't care. Uh, he and his generals and the, the, the party leadership still had courvoisier, flat screen TVs, et cetera. Uh, and so I don't think on a given day would North Korea strike down. Remember the map where they had a, they ignored the polar nature of the globe and they had a map showing attacking George Bush's hometown with nuclear weapons. He's not going to do that. Now, by the way, if somebody gets in there and kills him at three o'clock in the morning, the next guy up may have a screw loose. So we don't want North Korea to have nuclear weapons. 
uh, but they but this regime is unlikely to employ them. But they threaten us all the time. And again, that's that's dangerous talk. But I don't have a clue how. There's no magic solution. As long as China thinks they're going to end up with 30 million North Koreans in uh, China, and as long as China thinks that, uh, by the way, here's another controversial statement. I think if you talk to a Chinese foreign minister in private, he'd tell you he's happy that North and South Korea are divided. He's happy the US armed forces are in South Korea, Japan, and Okinawa. They're absolute enemy for all time when you wake up in the morning in Shanghai is Japan, not the United States. Uh, so I don't think, I think Chinese, the status quo, they don't want nuclear weapons in North Korea either, uh, but, but they're not, but they don't want the country to collapse. If the Chinese actually turned off the border completely, which they semi have with COVID, uh, there'd be an enormous trouble. North Korea is another unsolvable problem. You got to talk to them. You got to find ways to try and mitigate the paranoia. Um, but there's no, no good solution to that one either. Well, are there any other questions, gentlemen? Well, in the era of uh, Zoom fatigue, <laughs> this has been uh, very unfatiguing. Uh, but it is an hour and a half we're into it. And Barry, thank you so much. This has been very instructive, very informative. We're deeply grateful. And uh, my colleagues, my, uh, my other classmates, if you haven't submitted a reminiscence about somebody you knew at PA that you really liked, please do so. And also, if you haven't signed up for our reunion, please do so. And if you, if you want to do a, a me and three, please sign up. That at the reunion, we will have a chance to talk for about three minutes on, on whatever we'd like to talk about. But you have to sign up ahead of time. So, hey, Mike, yes. let, me, let me thank you for uh, chairing this meeting and to urge our classmates to get your incredible work oh. on Abraham Lincoln. And to well, thank all of you, my classmates. I didn't know a bunch of you very well, but I certainly have a wonderful abiding uh, views of, of Andover. And I've seen the campus a lot in recent years and love the way the school is operating today. Well, thanks so much for the plug for the book. And by the way, about the book, uh, be sure to buy it. You don't have to read it, but be sure to buy it, okay? <laughs> <laughs> thanks once everybody. Thanks for, thanks for coming. And thanks Judy for arranging this. And thanks again. Thank you. Thank you. What an thanks Michael, good job. Thank you. Bye, everybody.